because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that is the, I can't think of anything better. That's what's been on my mind this week. This morning, I want to look at, uh, in, in keeping with our theme for the year of the church, back to the basics, really, and the basic point is just how impactful the existence of God is in our lives. Um, I, I, I guess I'm stuck here on this, this passage um, because in this high school, I teach apologetics, which is, of course, defending the faith. And this is the very first point in defending the faith, and it comes back to the existence of God. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. I chose the scripture reading out of uh, Revelation chapter 4 uh, because it's an example of uh, worship. In my Bible, I have titles for each section written down that, that are provided by the particular publishing house, but chapter 4 is titled The Heavenly Worship. And, and truly, as we, as we read that this morning, not only do we get a picture of, of how the throne room of God is adorned, and it's, it just it sounds amazing when you really try to picture those things in your minds, but... But when we get to verse 8, we see the adoration and the worship and praise of God and the fact that that continues on day after day, perpetually continuing. It it has been going on for all of existence, for all of eternity, and it will continue to go on for all of eternity. And, And so when I consider that passage, it just, it really strikes me with a sense of awe and honestly, this week I got pretty, I kept getting distracted uh, because I kept wanting to go back to the subject of worship and, and look at that. Uh, but when I really thought about it, the reason we worship is because God exists. And, and it really does change things for us. It really is the power that we have in our lives, the fact that God exists and and it makes us so different than everybody else and it's really a matter of hope right the title you see up there given answer comes out of 1st Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 1st Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 and that verse is uh, but sanctify yourselves therefore uh, sanctify the Lord therefore in your hearts and be ready to give an an answer to every man of the hope that lies within you that's our responsibility First of all, to sanctify the Lord in our hearts, to set him apart. And if we're going to set the Lord our God apart in our minds, then we, un- we need to understand that he exists, and we need to understand who he is in his existence. And so we're going to look at that this morning. But, but the follow-up to that, when we realize who God is, there's a responsibility on our part, and that is to be able to share that with people around us who don't realize that God exists, because it's the thing that's going to change their life in an eternal sense. It'll change your life in an eternal sense as we look at these things. Our hope is eternity dwelling with God free from pain and suffering. That's the hope that lies within us. And we could phrase that probably a hundred other ways as we study in the scripture, but that's the one that stands out in our minds. Pastor's been focusing on in 1 John, in the book of 1 John the last couple of weeks, and so I want to draw your attention to a definition that uh, he, is, he is brought forth from the second chapter of jo- uh, 1 John, verses 16 and 17, and that's really the world. When John talks about the world, he's not just talking about people, but he's talking about the operating system of the world around us. And it's very important that we keep this in our minds as we take a look at our wonderful Lord and Savior this morning. First of all, the world around us rejects God and Jesus Christ. Everything about the world around us denies and rejects God. And it's focused on self-pleasure, self-promotion, and self-purpose. All right, one of the tools we use in the apologetics course that's brought out in the discussion of determining which religion is truth are what we call the five essential questions of life. And they'll come up here on the next slide. This, the, the text is a little small, so I will read these. Number one is a question of origin. Where did we come from? Number two, it's a question of identity. Who are we? Number three, what is our purpose or what is the meaning of life? Number four, how should we live or morality, the idea of morality? And number five, where are we headed for eternity? What is our destiny? And so what I've written up there after each one of those questions is basically a summation. If you don't believe God exists, 
This is the answer to those questions. The, que the answer to the origin question, where did we come from? We came from nothing. Or if you want to elaborate, we came from a big bang, apparently. Question number two, who are we? We are a random cohesion of elements and chemicals that just decided after the Big Bang to get together for no reason. Number three, what is our purpose or meaning? Well, if we just randomly coalesce from, from elements, then there is no purpose, there's no meaning, and there's no objective to our lives. That leads us into the fourth question, well, how should we live? If there's no purpose, no meaning, and no objective, then you can live however you want. You can live your truth because good and evil are not real. So there's no need to consider your actions as good or bad. You just get to do what you want, when you want, how you want, regardless of how it affects those around you. And finally, where are we headed for eternity? Back to nothing, I guess. Because there's no rules and no system to follow. But we meet here today because we're children of God and we know that God exists. And so what we'll see when we get back to the end of this is, is we're going to see how we answer these questions with the existence of God in mind. The answer to these questions without God are sobering when you truly consider the merits I'm so thankful that God exists and that our identity as believers is rooted in his personality, his character, his nature. Let's consider the biblical evidence that supports God this morning. The first verse that comes to mind really too, John chapter 1, if you turn there, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. God created the universe through the power of His Word. That's what we read here in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So when we go back to Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We see not only that God was there, but Jesus Christ is there as well. Because John chapter 1, when we get down to verse 14, we see, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 14 tells us that the word is Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ came down and dwelt among us as flesh. So the universe was created by God through the power of his word in Genesis 1.1. From that fact, we need to look, first of all, that God is eternally existent. God is eternally existent. Psalm, that means he existed before creation and he will continue to exist forever he is not affected by time space or matter because they were created in the beginning when God created the heaven space the earth the matter all right and time when he divided the day and the night in the preceding verses so before God created, there was nothing. God always existed, but before he created, there was nothing. But he created. Revelation 1.8 says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come. A statement from Jesus Christ himself to John to write down the things that he's going to tell John about, the, about how things are ending, but he starts with who he is. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. And then he tells us, the Lord, says the Lord, which is, he is currently now, which was, he was at the beginning, and which is to come. He's going to be in the future. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And Isaiah 41 4 says, Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I 
am he. His eternal nature gives purpose and meaning to the beginning of all things. According to Ephesians chapter 1, let's look at verses 4 through 6. Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 4 through 6. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of, his, of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. What we see right here in Ephesians is the purpose behind God creating us. We are created for his glory. And in order to give God glory, we have to live a specific way. And that is that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So when we consider this, the idea that without God, everything came from nothing, immediately there is no purpose. But when you consider the existence of God and the record of Scripture, God creates with intention and with purpose. And that ties in a whole lot to our identity, which we'll get to later on. The eternal existence of God gives us confidence that God has never, nor will he ever, cease to exist. Therefore, his sustaining providential control of all things and events is assured. God created everything. God controls everything by the power of his word. He sustains all things in life. And that includes you and I. So when we face the trials of life, we have this hope once again, because God is our creator. He's in control of all things. He knows the end from the beginning. We don't. We have to trust in him. And you know what? When we learn to trust in God, it's a wonderful thing because we can focus on who God is and let him figure out the details. It simplifies our life in an amazing way. But if you don't believe there's a God, then you have a tremendous amount of anxiety and worry in your life because you have a whole lot of details to work out for yourself. God is eternally existent. Secondly, God is all powerful. God is all powerful. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm. There is nothing too hard for thee. God's omnipotence is displayed in creation, showing that he has power to bring everything into existence out of nothing and it is in keeping with his own nature. We see God's power displayed in creation. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. When we look around us, even people who don't know God exist, if they really consider the natural world around them, they come to the conclusion that there has to be a great being out there. In the course of my time in church, I have heard multiple missionaries testify of that very fact. Going to a village or a corner of the world that's never heard of God before, and when the, the, the truth of the gospel is represented, they, they find out two things. Number one, they realize it because they're so in tune with the natural world that there is something out there that's greater than them. And when they hear the truth of God's word, the connection is nearly instantaneous and whole villages convert in a matter of days. Because of the existence of God, because nature, because God's work testifies of his power, we see that. So God's power is displayed in creation. God's power is displayed in the preservation of all things. Hebrews 1, 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Who is the word of God's power? Jesus Christ. That's amazing. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Who's that verse referring to? 
Jesus Christ. Our Lord and Savior, his person, his work, the things that he, done, he has done, his power is displayed in the way that he sustains all of the universe. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that you call Father. He's displayed in, his power is displayed in creation. His power is displayed in preservation of all things. His power was displayed in the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. Deuteronomy 26, verse 8, Moses is re relaying yet again an account of how they have come back to where they are in, in their current situation. Deuteronomy chapter 6, and verse 8, And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terribleness and with signs and with wonders. And just recently we went through, the, through Egypt, I believe it's on a Wednesday night in Pastor's uh, series on uh, the tragedy of life. And the very first one was the tragedy of Pharaoh. And we saw that those signs and wonders and the terrible power of God was wrought on Egypt, right, in opposition to the gods that they worshipped. A demonstration of God's power over everything. And the futility of life and belief without God. It was a powerful and painful lesson for Pharaoh and the nation of Egypt. Lastly, we see God's power is displayed in the resurrection of Christ. 2 Corinthians 13, 4. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. When Jesus cried, it is finished on the cross and he gave up the ghost. He ascended, or excuse me, the Bible says he descended into captivity to set the captives free. To rise again on the third day in victory over death. And that is the hope that we have. Jesus Christ died on the cross after living a sinful life that fulfilled the penalty of the law. And because he was able to do that, his sacrifice, his blood, is sufficient to cover the sins of the whole world. That just leaves you and I with one responsibility. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess with your mouth that he is Lord. That's how simple, that's how easy it becomes. But if we don't believe that God exists, then we have nothing to fall back on. We have to figure it all out ourselves, if it's possible. Lastly, God is holy. God is eternally existent. God is all-powerful. God is holy. And, and this part right here really drives the impact to us and really our response to the character of God. God's holiness means not only that he is separate from all that is unclean and evil, but also that he is positively pure and thus distinct from all others. Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15, for thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth in eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite heart and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Now, what we see here in Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15 with reference to the holiness of God is three particular aspects to the holiness of God. And I will point out the, where in the verse these, these are being drawn from uh, as we look into this. First, it's his intrinsic holiness or conformity to his perfect nature. We see this in the phrase the high and holy one, the high, excuse me, the high and lofty one. And again, uh, his name is holy. I dwell in the high and the holy place. Everything about God speaks of purity, speaks of distinctness. It speaks of uniqueness. There is nothing and no one that is like God, and there never will be. 
And that's what, we, that's what we're trying to explain when we talk about the intrinsic holiness of God. He is separate from evil. Habakkuk 1, verses 12 through 13. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine holy one? We shall not die. O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. And canst not look on iniquity, wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. If you remember this from a sermon I preached not too long ago, this is Habakkuk asking God, why are you using an evil nation to punish your children? And he states in the middle of that, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil. Habakkuk is giving credit to the fact that God cannot be in the presence of sin, of evil. That is how pure and how holy he is. Secondly, his holiness means that he is perfect in work. Psalm 145, 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. Everything that God does because he is holy is righteous. We could substitute the word good there. Everything he does. And he is holy in all his works. Why? Because it's his nature. Because it's his nature. Lastly, God is the standard of holiness. When we are talking about the intrinsic holiness of God, we are talking about the fact that he is the standard of holiness that everything must submit to. Leviticus 20 and verses 7 and 8, Sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy. For I am the Lord your God, and ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. Check this out. God created the universe and he created us. Therefore, we belong to him. He has the right to direct us and to expect things from us. And here the commandment is, be ye holy. I am the Lord God. It's based on who he is. Not who you think you are. It's based on who God is. And we are commanded to be holy because God is holy. And in order to do that, we need to keep his statues and we need to do them. Why? Because God has sanctified us. That word sanctify is part of this idea of holy, excuse me, of holiness. It has the aspect of separating, separating from. All right, ladies, I know you have special dishes in your house that you only use for certain occasions. You might say those are holy dishes because they are set apart for a specific use. Okay, it's a, it's a silly illustration, but at the same time, it's very simple and real. We are to be set apart for use by God. And so if, if we don't understand, if we don't have the right concept of God's holiness, we can't imitate that holiness, right? Part of our identity, we are made in the image of God. That means we need to strive to be like him. Will we ever be fully like him? No, because we're not God. But our job is to attempt to do so. And he's given us his word so in order that we might know how to do that. So the first part is God's intrinsic holiness. The second part is his, his transcendent holiness. This speaks to the fact that he is separate and distinct from his creation. All right? Noted in Isaiah 57, 15 by the high and lofty one, right? Where, that's a description of him. And then he dwells. Where does he dwell? I dwell in the high and holy place. That is not here where we live. He lives somewhere else, the high and the holy place. Why? Because he created everything. He is outside of everything. Going back to the fact that God is not affected by time, space, or matter, that means he's outside of it. He doesn't dwell here with us because he's transcendent. God's holy nature is distinct from creation. Exodus 15, 11, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises and doing wonders? Nobody compares to God. Nobody compares to God because he is distinct. 
There's also separation from God because we're not holy. And because based on Habakkuk, the Lord can't be in the presence of holy, that means we can't be in his presence. In and of ourselves, we cannot be in his presence because we are not holy. God is holy, but we are not. Something needs to happen in order to make that, uh, make that reality. And when you think about that, you can put yourself in the, in the mind of Isaiah, in, in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, he's standing there and he's seeing this vision, probably a similar vision to what we read in, in Revelation chapter 4, and he's realizing who God is and who he is in comparison to that standard of holiness and righteousness. And it causes him to say, then said I, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of, unclean, of, of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the Lord of hosts. When we get a real glimpse of who God is, it's change worthy. I would even say it's devastating because we, we hold ourselves up in such high regard. Why? Because we live in a world that tells us that everything is about us. And so we have this, this high opinion of ourselves until we can get in a position where we see who God is and then it becomes absolutely devastating because we are nothing in comparison to God's power and God's glory. God's holiness and that's exactly what Isaiah saw. And I think, I think you, most of you would agree, we think Isaiah is a pretty good guy. He's a great prophet. Some of us might even say, hey, he's a much better Christian than I ever would be or will be. But when he sees God, he's immediately humbled by his character and personality. Lastly, in this verse, we see the imminent holiness of God which means he dwells with us. Yes, he's high and lofty and he's separate and distinct from us, but he condescends himself to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And an answer to the hope that lies within us is that in eternity, we're gonna dwell with God. We don't dwell with God now, but in eternity, our hope is that we dwell with God free from pain and suffering. We go back to John chapter 1, verses 11 through 14. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, and he was surrounded by his people, and his people rejected him. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. How and why did we become sons of God? Because it was God's will that goes back to his power and his eternal existence. God created for a purpose, and that purpose was to have a relationship with us. And we know that before he founded the world and the universe, he had a plan for redemption. Because he's omniscient, he knows that man was going to fail. And he had a plan to redeem us before he created the world and the universe. That's simply amazing. And verse 14, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. <clears throat> Understanding that we come from an eternal, all-powerful and holy God helps us recognize our value and the intentionality behind our existence. And when you cast that on to those five questions that we started with, we get some different answers. Question number one, where did we come from? Or the question of origin. The eternally existing God created the universe for his glory. And we're a part of that creation. Question number two, who are we 
We are created in the image of God for the purpose of glorifying him. Be ye holy. I am the Lord your God. Pastor Barter, what does it mean to be holy? Keep yourself separate from the world and live a life that is distinct, distinctly for God, distinctly in line with the word of God. That is what we are supposed to do. That's why we were created. What is our purpose and meaning? Man is, man is created for the glory of God and tasked with bringing the rest of the fallen creation back into a relationship with God for God's glory. Where does that come from? That comes from the first couple of chapters of Genesis. Adam and Eve were tasked with being fruitful and multiplying and subduing the earth and bringing it under their dominion, taking care of creation. How do we do that? Once they, once they fell in sin, all of, the, all of creation is corrupted by sin. And only through the blood of Jesus Christ can we get back on the path to returning things to where they are. But mark this. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who's going to finish that work when he returns. But we have a job. We have a purpose here. It's to glorify God right, and make him known to others so that they can also do what they're supposed to do, which is to glorify God. But we can't do that until we know for sure who God is. So if you can't settle in your mind whether, whether or not there's a God, I think you're stuck in a problem place. And if you have settled in your mind that there is a God, then the challenge is, is, are you living up to your purpose? Question number four, how should we live as a reflection of God? We're made in the image of God who is holy. We are meant to live a holy life. We just mentioned that. Separate from sin and distinct from the world. Simple terms. Plain and simple. Number five, we are headed for eternity. If we believe in God and Lord Jesus Christ, believe and confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are bound for an eternity, everlasting eternity, one that doesn't end, dwelling with God and Him dwelling with us, free from the curse of sin. And if we don't, if we reject God, if we reject his son, Jesus Christ, and the work he did on the cross, then we're bound for an eternity of suffering and separation from God. Friends, eternity is a long time. A long time that never ends. Right? But I'm so thankful when we go back to Revelation chapter 4, Let's go back there real quick. I want to read verses 8 through 12 once again and, and leave you with this picture of, of the hope that lies within us. Because this is where I'm going to be. I know that without a shadow of a doubt. And I pray that every single one that's here today is going to be with me here in this spot, observing and taking part in this. Because this is really the hope that we cling to. Verse 8 says again, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is to come. They rested not day or night. Continually, saying and praising, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which is and which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who lived forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Man, I can't wait to be there. That's what we get to do for eternity.
But you know what? That's what we should be doing right here and right now. Giving glory to God with our lives. We can't do it unless we can live in the way that God expects us to live. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I ask that you would, you would consider these things this morning. Are you sure? Do you know that God exists? Do you believe that his son, Jesus Christ, lived a sinless life, left his, left his home in heaven and his deity by God's side, came down to be born in a human body and be limited by all the things that we're limited by, yet live a life that was sinless in order to die on a cross in excruciating pain and humiliation so that your sin and my sin would be paid for. and the sins of everyone who would be born. I am 100% confident, confident that your relationship with Christ is going to be the thing that makes your life so different than everybody around you. And if you've not entered into a relationship with Christ, I want to challenge you to do that today. We've got men and women who will counsel with you and show you from the word of God how you can enter into that relationship if you don't already understand that. But you know, for those of you who have entered in that relationship and you've let it stall out and falter and, and maybe fade a little bit, I want to challenge you, stay in your Bible. Be like Isaiah, get a glimpse of who God is and allow it to motivate you and encourage you to live in the way that you should as a child of God, as a representative of God here on earth, a holy God who's eternally existent and all-powerful. That's the challenge we have before us, before us this morning. If you would please stand to your feet. The altars are open. If you would like to come forward and, and pray, please do so.